I started drinking coffee at an unusually young age. My parents had their coffee pot on a timer, and in the morning I would bring them their cups of coffee, and then I would help myself to the remainder of the pot with lots and lots of milk and sugar. Coffee was discovered long before I came along in the 80s, so long ago, in fact, that there are many legends as to how, so we'll just go with my favorite. Kaldi, an Ethiopian goat herder in the 9th century, observed that his goats were energized after eating a coffee cherry. So he tried the cherry and too felt the same results. Coffee then spread to, through the Middle East and on to Europe. And during the 16th century, while gaining popularity in Italy, its opposition referred to it as the bitter invention of Satan and insisted that Pope Clement VIII intervene. But he said that he must try the beverage before ruling on it, and it liked it so much he deemed it a Christian beverage. <laughs> Through various explorers and trading routes, coffee has made its way around the world and is now cultivated in tropic and subtropic regions, shown here. This map illustrates the two most common varietals, Robusta and Arabica, and M is for mixed. In 2008, I had my first encounter with coffee at Origin, while crazily on a motorcycle journey through Colombia. This would forever change my relationship with coffee, and so tonight I'd like to share a few things I've learned about coffee along the way. Coffee does grow on trees. This is a ripe coffee cherry. The bean is inside. Often coffee is intercropped with other crops such as corn, cacao, bananas, and it is grown um, most often on steep hillsides in volcanic soil at elevations of 3,000 to 6,500 meters. This is Don Elias. He showed me around his farm in Colombia, and here he's shown picking the coffee cherries by hand, milling them by hand, and drying them in the sun. They must be raked every few hours to prevent mildew from developing for a few weeks. This is the tropics, remember, not Montana. Coffee can be wet or dry processed. Wet processed means that the cherry is removed and the bean is washed before it is dried. And dry processed means that the cherry is left on the bean during the drying phase. And this will have a dramatic effect on the flavor of the coffee when you brew it. Once the beans are dried, the parchment paper must be removed. Here we are in Laos on my honeymoon manually removing the parchment paper from coffee. Yes, small obsession. The farmer here is then using a basket to toss the beans into the air, allowing the parchment paper to blow away in the wind. Finally, after all of these steps, we have a green bean that can now be roasted. Roasting is as simple as adding heat to the bean. You can do it on a stovetop, like I am here in a wok, or in a popcorn popper at home, or in a commercial roaster. There is some technique involved, however, to make it actually taste good. <laughs> coffee is seasonal. With all of this chatter about coffee being a crop, this probably seems natural, but we often don't stop to think about that coffee is seasonal. Most countries only harvest coffee once a year, with some having a small second harvest. Coffee has become a vital cash crop in, crop in many developing nations, um, accounting for over 100 million people who rely on it as their primary source of income in developing countries. That makes it the number two most valuable commodity in the world behind oil. So, who's drinking all this coffee? Typically, the green beans are packaged into 60 to 70 kilogram burlap sacks and shipped all over the globe. About 12 billion pounds of coffee is produced annually, and the United States has about 130 million coffee drinkers. I'm sure we have a few here tonight. And at Origin, they are drinking instant coffee, usually. They ship off all the good stuff. So let's take just a moment to think back on what goes into your cup of coffee in the morning. Your coffee is grown, usually picked by hand, dried, milled, packaged, shipped to the US, shipped to the roaster, roasted, packaged, and taken to you at home. And it takes about 150 beans to make just your 12 ounce cup of coffee. The coffee industry in the United States has seen three distinct waves. The first being the industrialization of coffee by companies like Maxwell Health and 
Folgers, then the specialty movement of Starbucks and Pete's, and now we're in what's considered the third wave of coffee. Third wave coffee is much like that of the craft beer movement. Small craft roasters are popping up all over the country. So what makes a craft roaster? Craft roasters focus on sourcing high quality specialty beans. They roast in small batches, focusing on highlighting the true characteristics of the bean. And they utilize brewing methods to prepare your coffee one cup at a time, pour over, French press. In doing so, the coffee takes on a more delicate and complex flavor, similar to that of wine. I've now graduated to a commercial roaster. This is Fran, and she and I spend many hours together trying to figure out the perfect roast for each bean. And as it turns out, there is such a thing as crappy coffee. Anyone remember Jack Nicholson's character in The Bucket List? He was obsessed with Kopi Luwak. And here it is. In Southeast Asia, there is an animal called the palm civet, which roams coffee farms and eats the cherries off the ground, and then poops them out. The coffee is said to have a reduced acidity that is removed by their digestive system, and this delicacy <laughs> fetches up to $700 a kilogram. Coffee has an impressive impact on cultures and traditions all over the globe. In Ethiopia, they roast, brew, and drink together all in one sitting. In Australia, they drink long blacks and flat whites. In Italy, you have to pay more to sit down than you do to go. And in the US, coffee fuels our daily lives through morning rituals, working in cafes, socializing with friends. And at the end of the day, coffee is one of the ways that makes our world just a little bit more connected. Thank you. <laughs>